Welcome to another episode of the Drivers Alert Driving Safety Podcast, where we interview some of the most influential people in driving safety. Distracted driving is an epidemic that is taking nine American lives every day, and the real number is likely much higher. Why? Because distracted driving is difficult to prove. And what is insulting is the reality that many distracted drivers who kill or injure receive only minimal punishment. Our guest today, J.C. Good, is all too familiar with this topic. On May 18th of 2008, JC and her parents were on the road on their way back home after attending JC's college graduation earlier that day. About halfway through their road trip while passing through an intersection with a green light, the vehicle carrying JC and her parents was struck head on by a tractor trailer. The truck had swerved to avoid a car attempting to make a left turn through a red light. The driver of that car, an 18 year old man talking on his cell phone. Unfortunately, JC's parents died at the scene and J.C. spent four months in the hospital suffering from severe body trauma and a traumatic brain injury, which has left her unable to use her left arm or lower leg. Also to this day, she is still dealing with lingering cognitive issues, but J.C. is a fighter and has turned this unnecessary tragedy into a mission to help others. J.C. is a nationally recognized speaker and a co-founder of the organization Hang Up and Drive, where she advocates for cell-free roads. She has shared her story hundreds, if not thousands of times, and has done so via many notable venues, including the Oprah Winfrey Show and the United Nations. JC has also worked with the U.S. Department of Transportation, the National Transportation Safety Board, and the National Safety Council, and is featured in a PSA for AT&T's It Can Wait campaign that has been viewed more than two and a half million times on YouTube. JC, that was uh, long-winded, but thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, before we get into the interview, I would like to show viewers the public service announcement that you did appear in with AT&T's uh, It Can Wait campaign. It can be found on YouTube on the channel Summer Break. Uh, it's probably one of the best I've ever seen on distracted driving. So let's go ahead and play that. So as a story, I just confess that I text and drive. <laughs> if I get a text, I look at my phone. It's definitely texting. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat. I do Snapchat and drive sometimes. Is that like making Snapchats or watching them? What Making them. A, texting is like my main form of communication. Boredom, honestly. And B, well, no, nah, I guess no, it's really just A. <laughs> I've only never done it at stoplights. I've always been really good about it. The passenger has a pretty important role driving now where they're like, oh, red light, red light. If someone that you like texts you, you're like, you can't just like let it sit there without just knowing what they said. Because what if something exciting's happening or something happened? Like, every time I do it, I kind of, I think about it. I'm like, why am I doing this? And then I just keep doing it. So I'd like to, like, want to introduce you to a friend of ours. My name's JC. Hi, Alexis. Hi, Dash. Justin, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I just really quickly want to have a chat, tell you what happened to me. When I was 21 years old, driving home from my college graduation ceremony. Driver on his phone was so distracted, he turned left into the intersection at a red light. Another car, an 18-wheeler, swerved to miss him and hit my family's car. And the resulting collision actually killed both of my parents. I spent two months in the hospital fighting for my own life, and then two more months in a rehab hospital, learning how to walk again, learning how to speak again, learning how to dress myself and how to feed myself. Uh, I live with a partially paralyzed body. I didn't have my daddy to walk me down the aisle when I got married. Having sort of like met JC, could you look at JC and sort of give those same reasons? <sighs> Usually I use my phone to change a, a song on. I try, I try to use it as little as possible, but. I'm not going to look at my phone ever again. 
Honestly, if I have been sitting at a red light, and I'll like glance down to see if my mom's texting me, but the people's lives that are impacted from something that is so stupid. I can assure you on my drive home right now, I'm not going to use my phone and drive, and I'm not gonna do it when I go to work tomorrow and the next day after that until you know it becomes a habit and that just doesn't happen at all. I know this is hard, I'm sorry. It's hard for me too, but you know this is real. You have the power to really actually make a difference and do something about it. Every time I watch that video, uh, it still affects me, JC. I think first, it was really well produced, and second, it, it, you can feel the real emotions from, from the people that you're talking to. Um, the, the, that you have kind of like the two faces on the, on, the, on the before, really, people are sitting around kind of comfortable, enjoying themselves, kind of having a good time, and talking about, in a lighthearted sense, texting and driving, and then you enter in the mood changes. Can you tell us a little bit about um, kind of what, what the context was for that particular PSA? It was just trying to get people to look someone in the eyes, I think is the biggest message, that you can admit to the things that you might do wrong when you're with your friends. It's easy to laugh about, but then when you have to sit and look someone in the eyes, and I challenge people to do it almost every day, to look someone like me in the eyes and tell them that a phone is more important than a human life. Do you, in your interactions with them during that filming, do you, do you feel like, could you see there was an effect that was being had? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can only hope it lasted beyond them walking out of that room. And, and the participants who were in this uh, video, what, what were they, I don't, I'm not sure, what were they told they were there for? I guess this was part of kind of a YouTube series. Right. They didn't really know. They knew they were doing something about texting and driving, but I think they had no idea what exactly it would be. The, the one element of your story, I think, that really caught my attention that, that, that led me to reach out to you to interview was, um, you know, this, this, this aspect of the story where this event, this tragic event literally happened on the day of your college graduation. And there's this picture, I think this photo I saw of you in your, in your graduation gown and you're holding your diploma and just thinking and reflecting on that just only hours after that, the, your whole world turned upside down. Um, what were your plans for the future at that point on that day, earlier that day? What, what, were you, what, was it, what was your future looking like? What were you planning to do? I was 21 years old and I thought I had this life figured out that I'd been dating the same kid for four years. We'd get married and have the kids we had spent the last four years talking about. I'd been hired to work for Habitat for Humanity that and get to learn how to build houses much like my parents built the house that I grew up in. And so I was kind of so excited for that next step of real life and being done with school. And your your entire family, or at least your immediate family, was there at the graduation, correct? Right. How how long were you and you were in a coma, correct? Yes. And you said uh, they were giving you like a ten percent chance coma, to live. Medically induced coma for about two and a half weeks. So there, so obviously there was a lag time before you had a chance to really reflect on what happened. And I'm just imagine again thinking about. You know, having one of the highest moments in your life of graduating from college and then later on, you know, a couple of weeks, whatever it was, thinking back about, you know, how your life changed. I mean, how, what, what were some of the things that were going through your mind in the weeks that, 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 that came after that event? I mean, I, I got to be honest, I was so badly brain injured and I was fortunate, I think, that I was so badly brain injured. I don't have any of my own memories for about three months. It isn't even until the four month mark that 
I even understand what had happened to my family it was moving back into my parents' house and realizing that my parents aren't sleeping in their bed or going to work. And this wasn't some practical joke. I was convinced it had to be some horrible joke that was being playing it on me because it hurt too much to be real. And I think I heard in one of the interviews or videos that you had done, this had obviously impacted and affected many people, some who didn't even know you. I think you said there were even strangers that visited you in the hospital, correct? That's correct. Um, The ripples that come out of this kind of a tragedy are astounding when you start to count how many people might be touched when something bad happens. So in in 2008 in Pennsylvania, there, there were no laws regarding cell phone use behind the wheel, correct? Correct. And what whatever happened to the driver then? Did you ever confront the driver, meet them, have a chance to talk to them? Anything legally come about of this? I mean, would there's no, I mean, I, I guess you could say it was reckless driving, at least at a minimum, I mean, even though there might not have been a law in the books for, for, for texting and driving, but did anything happen? Um, according, I guess the man who was on his phone got a ticket for running a red light, but the district attorney determined that it was all caused by a cell phone. And because it was not illegal to use a phone and drive, there were no criminal charges. So it was two other drivers. You know, it wasn't the distracted driver who hit me, but a third driver who was also falling kind of into that ripple because of his choice to swerve hitting my car. Oh, that's right. Correct. So the, it was the, 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 the tractor trailer was trying to avoid the person who had run the red light. Correct. Right. Okay. How how long did it take for you before you were well enough to start thinking about the next steps in your life? It was months. It wasn't until probably early 2009, so six or seven months after the fact, that actually one of my good friends from college, I think in college I had this reputation that I was going to save the world. That was the kind of, that was the joke that everyone teased me with. And one of my good friends said, so are you back to saving the world yet? And I said, I can barely speak or walk or do anything. But this friend happened to be involved in politics in Pennsylvania and gave me the contact information of a representative trying to get a law passed. And that was such an inspiration for me to go and share this story in the state capitol in Pennsylvania to try and try and make sense of what had happened. And and so the lack, I guess the lack of conviction in this particular case was kind of one of the things that convinced you to get involved in, in, in trying to push for stricter laws. Absolutely. It was trying to prevent another family from having to feel this kind of pain for such a senseless reason. And and there, you mentioned there was a press conference in Pennsylvania too, where you, you actually spoke in the, the topic, of course, was distracted driving. And was this the kind of the impetus for pushing for this this uh, this new law? Yeah, that was my very first chance to share this story to try and make a difference. And do you remember when when did the uh, first uh, version of the law? I don't. I, I'm assuming there's probably more than one version of it since then. But when did the first form of distracted driving law get passed in Pennsylvania? I believe 2011, they made a really weak texting and driving law. Unfortunately, it's still the only thing in place in Pennsylvania. It's interesting, too. We're we're down here in South Florida, and Florida is notoriously bad for a a variety of things related to, to driving. And one of them, of course, is the distracted driving law. We We have one, but it's a secondary offense. So in order for you to be ticketed, you you have to be pulled over for another reason. Uh, and me being a cyclist, uh, I, it's been concerning to me to to go out on the roads down here, and so I haven't done a lot of it. But about a month or so ago, I was uh, I went for a couple of trips of twenty five or thirty miles on a Saturday and Sunday back to back, and you you get a different perspective of traffic when you're not the driver. You know, you're a pedestrian, you're on a bicycle, you're more vulnerable. And um, there were half a dozen times each day when I had some close calls where if I hadn't been paying attention and thinking in a defensive mindset, it could have gone horribly wrong. But the one that stands out to me was 
a lot of times, unfortunately, down here, I, I have to be on the sidewalk because it's so scary to drive to to cycle on roads. And I was crossing a sidewalk in front of a CVS drugstore where you had this entryway uh, in and out of the parking lot. And this one lady was uh, leaving the CVS and she was about to go into the road. And the whole time she's looking down at her phone. And had I not been locking eyes on her watching what she was doing, it could have ended up rolling over her hood. And it wasn't to the last moment she looked up at me and she had that shock on her face like she knew, wow, that could have gone really badly. And and I'm just thinking to myself, she literally just got in her car after being in the CVS. And whatever it was was so important that she had to be on her phone literally within 30 seconds probably of getting in her car. And I just, it shakes my, I shake my head thinking it makes no sense. I think that's the case with a lot of these stories that people just get in their cars. They feel like they need to finish up what they're doing. And for too many people, a scenario like you just described, it doesn't act as a wake up call. They pull out in the road and they get right back on their phone, but we need to use those little moments of fear to make us be better drivers. We, we've interviewed many people about the distracted driving topic. And, you know, each time we do it, I keep thinking, well, hasn't this already been covered? You know, it, it's we, we, we talk about it so much, but it's so prevalent. And it seems like it's getting even worse in many cases. But I, I think in, there's two ways to look at it. One is you know, there, there are different angles that you can approach and talk about the topic. But then second, you're, you're, there's always somebody in the audience who's hearing this for the first time or paying attention for the first time. And, and, and whatever it is, there might be something that catches their attention that helps change their mindset. So I hope, I, I have to believe we're making progress, but thinking about how much of your life has become consumed by this mission, how do you stay motivated? We have to make a difference. At the rate that people are dying on our roads, I talk about the ripple effect. It's kind of if one of these ripples hasn't touched you yet, it's only a matter of time until every one of us has lost someone we love or gets hurt or some other preventable tragedy. And, and you're, you've been involved in many videos um, working with different agencies um, to create these public service announcements. Do you are you seeing some kind of impact? What do you think is the is a good approach to getting people to start thinking about their behaviors behind the wheel? Are you seeing something? I learned pretty early in sharing this story that a real story, I think especially one as horrifying as mine, can really actually have an impact on people to get them to change their behaviors. And I'm really fortunate to stay in touch with a lot of people that I've spoken to and getting to hear even years down the road how they heard me speak in high, when they were in high school and now they went away to college and them and their friends all made a pact when this one kid shared this my story. I, I saw just recently that the Utah State House of Representatives defeated a bill uh, that would have made Utah hands-free. Uh, and you see this every once in a while. I think Arizona has had some issues with it too, obviously Florida. Why do you think there's still lawmakers out there who just don't seem to get it? Any reason? It's an embarrassment. Like it's our politicians' jobs to keep us alive and keep us safe. Unfortunately, too often it becomes a partisan issue, which it absolutely is not. And everyone thinks... It won't happen to them until it does. And and the distracted awareness, uh, the distracted driving awareness campaign is not just here. It's it's gone global. I think in 2010, you even uh, paid a visit to the United Nations. You had a chance to meet the uh, the Secretary General Ki Moon. And uh, what what was the nature of that visit? Um, Ban Ki Moon was calling for an end to the global epidemic of distracted driving because everywhere there are roads, this is the thing that's killing us. Uh, our phones are designed to be really hard to put down. That's true whether you're in Florida or up here in New York or all the way over in Singapore where they have laws banning handheld and hands-free phone usage. Now, you, you've done, like I said in the intro, and, and you've done tremendous work here to raise awareness about distracted driving on, on many levels. You've made notable public appearances, been featured in dozens of articles. I think uh, 
even CNN did a, a news piece uh, on your story, press conferences, as we've talked about, and you become one of the key leaders in trying to fight this and make uh, people aware of distracted driving and help push for stricter laws. What do you think ultimately it's going to take to turn this around? What? Because I, 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 even on my commute to work, I see it's, it's just, it's everywhere around me. I have to drive even more defensively than ever. What, what is it going to take? I think cell phone companies and car companies need to stand up and recognize the science that's been there for years and actually take action to prevent, you know, we are not good at preventing this thing that's designed to be hard to put down. We got to find a way to physically stop the usage, I think is the only thing that's going to save us from ourselves. What about any stories that you might have that you can share on a personal level? I mean, obviously, you've done a lot of presentations and campaigns, but is there anything that you can recall where maybe in a one-to-one setting that you, you, you really got somebody to change their mindset? You feel like you really had an impact? And, you know, what, you know, what, what was the reaction or the emotion that was involved? I think some of my favorite stories, again, it's coming from social media, that a young man I met years ago, him and his friends made a pact. They put just like a little pouch, a little bag in the car. And whenever they all get in the car together, everyone's phone goes in that bag so that they can't be tempted. Oh, wow. That, that's, that's, that's very interesting. So we're, we're coming up on our allotted time. What, as you work for this whole mission of trying to increase awareness on, on distracted driving, what, or do you have any initiatives that are coming up that, that you'd like to talk about or any, anything of note? I don't think there's anything new and exciting other than phones keep getting smarter and we keep trying to do all the things that phones do while we're the only person in control of a car, I think. Young people are the people who can really make this difference. So I've got to keep sharing this story with young people and with corporations to get corporate bans in place to try and get us to wake up to this very real problem. And you have done some work with the National Safety Council too, correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay. How can, uh, I guess, for if people want to learn more about what you're doing, you have the website hangupanddrive.com. Is there any other way you want people to contact you? I believe I am the only JC Good out there. Um, I otherwise scorn social media, but it's great for sharing this message and keeping in touch with people. So I love using social media to try and make a difference. I, I, I fully hear you on that one. <laughs> what, what about any final thoughts or messages that you would like to leave with us before we go? Uh, just about the topic of driving safety, distracted driving in general, anything you'd like to share? I mean, it's what every person already knows. It's that there is nothing on a phone more important than a human life. And I love my phone, but as my mom always taught me, there's a time and there's a place. So you make your car a place where it's not okay to use your phone in any manner because of how deadly it can be. Yeah, that's a great, that is definitely a great message I think we could all live by. Well, JC, thank you so much for spending time with us today. I mean, I really do appreciate all the work that you've been doing to help make our roads cell free and um, uh, more power to you. And I, I hope, uh, hope we continue to do this and make a bigger impact. We're all behind you. We support you. Thank you. Once again, that was JC Good. She's the co-founder of Hang Up and Drive and without a doubt, one of the most prominent faces of the movement to end cell phone use behind the wheel. To stay up to date on our latest podcast episodes, please follow the Drivers Alert Driving Safety podcast page at driversalert.com forward slash driving hyphen safety hyphen podcast. There you will also be able to sign up for episode notifications as well as browse our episode archives. And don't forget the Drivers Alert Driving Safety podcast is the podcast that features the most influential people in driving safety. Until next time, please drive safely. And put your phone down.